people who wrote crime fiction um, a long time ago, say in the um, in the 20s and 30s of the last century, they were concerned about um, extraordinary ways of committing crimes, uh, a sort of locked room situation. And to my mind, that's now very old-fashioned. It's gone. I collected um, some um, instances of um, murder in a collection called The Reason Why. And in, in the um, introduction, I said that murder itself is not interesting. What is interesting is why people do these things. And it, it's a matter of motive. And those were the, um, the extracts that I collected for this anthology were concerned with um, why and not with how or, or, or when or anything, but, but with, with why. And that is what has always interested me. But in my early 20s, I'd stopped working. I'd, ha I'd, I'd had a baby. And um, I decided that I would like to write. Um, and when I started, I found that it was the most enjoyable thing I'd ever done. Can you identify what it is about it that makes it so enjoyable for you? I like to see if there are some things I can do. And since the sort of fiction I write is suspenseful, I like to feel that I can make people want to go on, turn the page. You'd been a reporter. Did you get a much... Do you feel you got much training out of being a journalist on a local paper? When I started to write fiction, I, I wasn't, of course, very successful at first. I read a lot of short stories, and um, um, I, I don't think they were very good, but they were the way I was learning to do it. I wrote different kinds of novels. Some of them I, I think that was rather foolish of me to try because I didn't have the experience. But then I wrote one novel which was quite, I, I think, quite amusing and light. And... Um, I did send it to um, a, a publisher, and I heard nothing for, um, as, as is always the way, for months. And then I did have a letter saying that they rather liked it. They said they didn't think that they would publish it, but I had I done anything else. And what I had done for fun to see if I could do it was a detective story called From Doon With Death, which... Um, featured in the Chief Inspector Wexford. They said that they would like me to do considerable rewriting, and I did. And on the 13th of February, 1964, they took it. The Wexford novels proved to be a great success and were made into the popular television series, The Ruth Rendell Mistress, starring George Baker as Wexford. He's a sort of steady, but he's an ordinary man. People identify with him, you see. Um, men identify with him, and women apparently fall in love with him. You've said that he you can see traces of your father and yourself in him. Could you expand on that a little? He brings a sort of original way of looking at... He does not accept... He doesn't accept that... that which is the accepted view of things. He he won't, he doesn't like cliches and he doesn't like a cliched way of looking at life. All those things are so. I never thought that um, Wexford was like my father until my son said so one day when he just said, Mother, do you realize that Wexford is your father? Uh, and he was doing a psychology course at the time, so what can you do? <laughs> Wexford sent for all his available men and set them to search the empty houses in King's Markham and its environs, the fields that lay still unspoilt between the High Street and the Kingsbrook Road, and, as afternoon came, the King's Brook itself. They postponed dragging operations until the shops had closed and the people dispersed. But even so, a crowd gathered on the bridge and stood peering over the parapet at the wading men. Wexford, 
who hated this particular kind of ghoulishness, this lust for dreadful sights thinly disguised under a mask of shocked sympathy, glowered at them and tried to persuade them to leave the bridge. Where did Wexford come from? I'd been on holiday to Ireland and uh, uh, drove around Ireland and um, it was a choice between Wexford and Waterford and Wexford won. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it, <laughs> that these things happen that way. Well, she wrote in the genre of crime writing, but she was primarily a writer whose books happened to include dreadful crimes. But uh, she isn't somebody um, who's a kind of second-rate peddler of whodunits. She's not interested in puzzles particularly, though the Wexford novels are, in fact, very, very good puzzles. She's primarily a novelist, like Simonon, or like Dostoevsky, who's interested in the psychology of the psychopath, and very often terrible things happen, therefore. But she's not primarily uh, an entertainer. She's primarily um, writing works of literature. And she's primarily someone who takes on strong contemporary themes. They're very, very well observed. They don't feel heavily researched, but she's always kept up with the modern world. She's always kept up with technology. She's incredibly accurate about topography, particularly London topography. So yes, she's always on top of things. You yourself, what are your obsessions? Um, I am an obsessive person, and that is how I, why I can, I think, describe obsessions. But, um, I'm very routine-driven. I do more than I should by the clock, I think. I always get up at the same time. I always, um, I always start writing at the same time. And I always eat the same food. Well, I don't when I go out and eat, and of course, the one eats out quite a lot. But when I'm at home, I always eat the same food. I eat what I like eating, and I eat the same thing every day. Now that. It's a bit odd, I think. Ruth Randall was the most self-disciplined and self-contained person I've ever met in this uh, South Bank show job. Everything seemed to be completely worked out, even rather small things. I remember meeting her outside the House of Lords one day when she'd just arrived, and so had I. And I'd walk from the office, and she'd walk from her place in London. And I didn't know she walked as much. I said, it's good walking around London, yes. I said, how much, you walk? how much do you walk? She said, I walk, I try to walk 11 miles a week because that's enough. If you do more than 11, it doesn't do any more good. But if you do 11, that's enough. And um, she said that with a little smile, but not much. It had been worked out, just like she had a ferocious routine. She wrote by the clock, started at the same time, finished at the same time. Ate the same food, did the same thing. Now, having said all that, maybe that was the way she could contain her life, given the um, mayhem <laughs> in her books. She wasn't interested in the gory details, like her great friend P.D. James. She was interested in why people acted like that. Two writers above all others have been credited with redefining the crime novel in this country. Ruth Rendell and P.D. James have also been friends for more than 20 years. There's this huge interest in the sort of dark recesses of the psychopathic mind. I mean, what is interesting to me about your psychopath, if I may say yours, my You dear, are, you, know, you may indeed, um, my You see, you're so different from Patricia Sysmith, who can make her psychopath into a hero or an anti-hero. You never condone, but on the other hand, you don't condemn. What you're trying to do is to understand That's and true. to explain. Yes, yes. Because I think we are more interested in character and in motive and, um, than we are in fast action in guns, in bullets. I'm terrible on weapons. Mm. If I've made, made mistakes, it's always with these guns. I don't have guns anymore. I can't cope with guns. I get them wrong, I think. I've got a book on guns. I still yes. can't get the guns right. No. So I suppose I'm so terribly uninterested in guns. I had shooting in only one of my books, and therefore I went to do some research with the Metropolitan Police, and I went to one of the um, police shooting training 
great halls which they do it. And they, they gave me the gun and I had my gun and they showed me how to do it. And it was most extraordinary. It was so completely functional. Um, and it fitted so right into the hand, and you held it like that. And for one second, I could see the attraction of being Could you to... now? I, I see you. I'm beginning to see you in a completely new light. Yeah. It's always uh, traditional to ask about a writer's childhood, and I don't see why we should break with it now. Uh, did you have a childhood that you look back on as something rather rich for you as a writer? I think perhaps I did, yes. My mother's family, who were uh, really as much Danish as they were Swedish, they all lived in London or in the outskirts of London. We lived in Woodford, E18 at the time. Did you speak two languages, was, or what, did your mother speak English? Or? My mother spoke English. My Swedish and Danish are no longer very good at all, but I do read those languages with great pleasure still. I, I read Swedish quite a lot. As I understand it, your mother had multiple sclerosis, which was unrecognised and undiagnosed at the time, but revealed itself in a certain um, clumsiness and obviously distress. Well, how did you live with that? When you, you somebody is clumsy, all you notice is really is that other people tell her that she is. And then you perhaps come yourself to um, feel that it is so. so. I think my mother's life was very sad from that point of view. You were an only child, and you were uh, English father. Your father started in a, working in a shipyard and then became a teacher, is that right? Yes. That's quite a transition. My father was a very clever and gifted man, um, with um, wonderfully well-read, and one of these people who can do anything about the house, you know, I mean, if, if one had a broken toy, and since I was a child, um, Th uh, throughout the war years, one had so little, and one things got broken, and they couldn't be replaced. And he would always say, "That's right, I'll do that," and mend it. And he would. And that is something um, a rather wonderful um, thing to have in, in in a parent that they can. You, you feel that they are all wise, all 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 knowing, and absolutely all powerful. You know. Ruth divides her time between London and Suffolk. Her writing is also divided. As well as the Wexford novels, she also writes stories which delve deeply into the minds of disturbed and dangerous people. Well, let's talk about those other books, which are, which are suspense stories, under your name, under the Ruth Rendell yeah. name. In many of them, there is no mystery. There is suspense, but there is no mystery. There is no, none of that whodunit element which is very present in the Wexford always, of course, but there's none of that. And so that in, for instance, A Judgment in Stone, we are told exactly what happens in the first sentence. That was quite bold, wasn't it? Yes, and it, of course, um, and Eunice Parchman a... killed the Coverdale family because she could not read or write. And it was bold, and one or two people didn't like it, but most people did. It was unfortunate for Eunice Parchman and for them that the people who employed her and in whose home she lived for nine months were peculiarly literate. Had they been a family of Philistines, they might be alive today. And Eunice, free in her mysterious, dark freedom of sensation and instinct and blank absence of the printed word. As soon as you open a Ruth Rendell book, you know you're in the real world, which is the world of all of us, as Wordsworth would say. Uh, you, you, you're not entering some fantasy world. Mm. And that's what's so disturbing about them, because when I've finished one, I feel nervous standing at a bus stop looking around thinking, that woman looks perfectly normal, but when she gets home, she wants to strangle her husband with silk stockings or something of that sort, um, because she manages to make the normal absolutely terrifying. She does, and how do you think she does that? It's partly a matter of pace, I think. Um, the horror creeps up, usually. Um, it's partly that she has this quality of almost blank sympathy. She's like the best kind of psychoanalyst. You could be sitting there telling her that uh, yesterday you went out on a common and you strangled somebody, 
Uh, and he didn't do it because he didn't like him. He did it because he just liked the feeling of somebody when he strangled him. Um, in fact, there is a whole novel about a man who just likes strangling people. He starts by strangling uh, a tailor's dummy in the basement. And then when the, the other lodgers in the house throw it away, he needs the sensation uh, of a dead woman in his arms. And so he just goes out and carries on doing it. But um, it's described in a really awful blank way, not an amoral way, because I think she was a very moral intelligence that she sees into the mind of these people. He had strangled her before he knew what he was doing, with his bare hands on her cold, smooth throat. The release had been almost as good as the real thing. She should save him. She should be, as those who would like to get hold of him would call it, his therapy. You inhabit minds, of, your fiction inhabits minds of appalling psychopaths, people who do the most dreadful things, and yet you don't go over the line to sort of describe what it is they do. Um, so you get into their skin, but as it were, um, you don't, uh, follow through is the wrong word, you don't sort of demonstrate them, see them at their evil work. You'd be surprised how many of my readers think I do and who write to me and tell me that was, that was terrible, that description of how you did. And I always say, but I didn't describe it at all. You imagined it. And that, I think, is something I do, that I somehow Im I plant in their minds the um, ability to imagine these things when I have never described them. That's fascinating. Well, yeah. it's, it's a mysterious business reading, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> You also, of course, write under the uh, write and publish under the name Barbara Vine. I used my second Christian name and the maiden name of one of my great grandmothers. What does distinguish them then? They're less sensational. They are. They have a slower pace. Um, they have a, a, a greater depth, and they usually, but not invariably, have a first-person narration. And you find that you're writing it using a slightly different style for these books? Well, it comes out differently, mm. and it seems to be enough to me to know that I'm writing it as Barbara Bind for it to be different, and I suppose that's really the answer to that. In 1997, longtime Labour Party supporter Ruth Rendell was made a life peer by the newly elected Prime Minister Tony Blair, taking the title Baroness Rendell of Baber. It was a great honour to me, yes. I suppose it didn't really occur to me to say no, if it didn't. Um, and I was very surprised and shocked and pleased for a long time. The House of Lords was to provide the setting of her most recent Barbara Vine novel. The doorkeeper says, Good morning, my lord, though it is 25 past two. But as peers should know when they've been here five minutes, it's morning in the House of Lords until prayers have been said. When I'm thinking of her now, I see her in what's called the Bishop's Bar in the Lords, which is a cosy little chatty place where you get sandwiches and, uh, and coffee and tea and drinks, if you want, and with uh, three or four women friends chatting away there, very animated. Uh, or I see her on the benches in the Lords. She wrote a book set in the Lords called Blood Doctor, waiting to speak and speaking very forcefully and clearly from a prepared script, of course, and doing it very well and fostering certain causes. And yet, even so, and all the time, there was something quite alone about her. She'd made it alone as a writer in a rather unusual way. Uh, she seemed to relish uh, the solitariness that the occupation brought her. And she was someone who was, one and the same time, aloof and engaged. At a memorial service, you would have been surprised at how high church Anglican it was. And traditional hymns and prayers in this atmosphere of Englishness and very, very sacred and um, solemn 
Christianity, which isn't, uh, isn't all that common these days. And you felt that you knew that that was a great deal to do with the way that she must have thought and felt herself. Most people would regard you as a very prolific and uh, compulsively prolific writer. Do you ever feel that you'd like to take two or three years off, or do you feel that the, act, the doing of it is the most important thing in your life? Well, it is what I do. I've been doing that in the mornings for 40 years. And I always do it in the mornings, unless I have to do something else, if it's possible. But I feel that the... Yeah, I, I, I would be confronted by it, but being at a loose end in the mornings, it's, um, it would be um, very strange. You see, um, I, I do what I do, and I, 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 I like it, and it seems to me to be um, a good thing, and my, my readers certainly do, so why stop?